Welcome to Classics You Slept Through's presentation of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 8. A Fair Captive from the Sky The third day after the incubator ceremony, we set forth toward home, but scarcely had the head of the procession debouched into an open ground before the city than orders were given for an immediate and hasty return. As though trained for years in this particular evolution, the green marshes melted like mist into the spacious doorways of the nearby buildings, until, in less than three minutes, the entire cavalcade of chariots, mastodons, and mounted warriors was nowhere to be seen. Sola and I had entered the building upon the front of the city, in fact, the same one in which I had had my encounter with the apes, and, wishing to see what had caused such sudden retreat, I mounted to an upper floor and peered from the window just out over the valley and the hills beyond. And there I saw the cause of their sudden scurrying to cover. A huge craft, long, low, and gray-painted, swung slowly over the crest of the nearest hill. Following it came another, and another, and another, until twenty of them, swinging low above the ground, sailed slowly and majestically towards us. Each carried a strange banner swung from stem to stern above the upper works, and upon the prow of each was painted some odd device that gleamed in the sunlight and showed plainly even at the distance at which we were from the vessels. I could see figures crowding the forward decks and upper works of the aircraft. Whether they had discovered us or simply were looking at the deserted city, I could not say. But in any event, they received a rude reception, for suddenly and without warning, the green Martian warriors fired a terrific volley from the windows of the building facing the little valley across which the great ships were so peacefully advancing. Instantly, the scene changed as if by magic. The foremost vessel swung broadside toward us, and bringing her guns into play returned our fire, at the same time moving parallel to our front for a short distance, and then turning back with the evident intention of completing a great circle which would bring her to up to position once more opposite our firing lane. The other vessels followed in her wake, each one opening upon us as she swung into position. Our own fire never diminished, and I doubt if twenty-five percent of our shots went wild. It had never been given me to see such deadly accuracy of aim, and it seemed as though a little figure on one of the craft dropped at the explosion of each bullet, while the banners and upper works dissolved in spurts of flame as the irresistible projectiles of our warriors mowed through them. The fire from the vessels was almost ineffectual, owing, as I afterward learned, the unexpected suddenness of the first volley, which caught the ship's crews entirely unprepared and the sighting apparatus of the guns unprotected from the deadly aim of our warriors. It seems that each green warrior has certain objective points for his fire under relatively identical circumstances of warfare. For example, a proportion of them, always the best marksmen, direct their fire entirely upon the wireless finding and sighting apparatus of the big guns of an attacking naval force. Another detail attends to the smaller guns in the same way. Others pick off the gunners, still other officers, while certain other quotas concentrate their attention upon the other members of the crew, upon the upper works, and upon the steering gear and propellers. Twenty minutes after the first volley, the great fleet swung, trailing off in the direction from which it had first appeared. Several of the craft were limping perceptibly, and seemed but barely under the control of their depleted crews. Their fire had ceased entirely, and all their energy seemed focused upon escape. The warriors then rushed up to the roofs of the buildings which we occupied, and followed the retreating armada with a continuous fusillade of deadly fire. One by one, however, the ships managed to dip below the crests of the outlying hills, until only one barely moving craft was in sight. This had received the brunt of our fire, and seemed to be entirely unmanned, as not a moving figure was visible upon her decks. Slowly she swung from her course, circling back towards us in an erratic and pitiful manner. Instantly the warriors ceased firing, for it was quite apparent that the vessel was entirely helpless, and far from being in a position to inflict harm upon us, she could not even control herself sufficiently to escape. As she neared the city, the warriors rushed out upon the plain to meet her, but it was evident that she still was too high for them to hope to reach her decks. From my vantage point in the window, I could see the bodies of her crew strewn about, although I could not make out what manner of creatures they might be. Not a sign of life was manifest upon her as she drifted slowly with the light breeze in a southeasterly direction. She was drifting some fifty feet above the ground, followed by all but some hundred of the warriors who had been ordered back to the roofs to cover the possibility of a return of the fleet or of reinforcements. It soon became evident that she would strike the face of the buildings about a mile south of our position, and as I watched the progress of the chase, I saw a number of warriors gallop ahead, dismount, and enter the building she seemed destined to touch. 
As the craft neared the building, and just before she struck, the Martian warriors swarmed upon her from the windows, and with their great spears eased the shock of the collision, and in a few moments they had thrown out grappling hooks and the big boat was being hauled to the ground by their fellows below. After making her fast, they swarmed the sides and searched the vessel from stem to stern. I could see them examining the dead sailors, evidently for signs of life, and presently a party of them appeared from below dragging a little figure among them. The creature was considerably less than half as tall as the green Martian warriors, and from my balcony I could see that it walked erect upon two legs, and surmised that it was some new and strange Martian monstrosity with which I had not as yet become acquainted. They removed their prisoner to the ground, and then commenced a systematic rifling of the vessel. This operation required several hours, during which time a number of the chariots were requisitioned to transport the loot, which consisted in arms, ammunition, silks, jewels, strangely carved stone vessels, and a quantity of solid foods and liquids, including many casks of water, the first I had seen since my advent upon Mars. After the last load had been removed, the warriors made lines fast to the craft and towed her far out into the valley in a southeasterly direction. A few of them then boarded her and were busily engaged in what appeared from my distant position as the emptying of the contents of various carboys upon the dead bodies, and of the sailors and over the decks and the works of the vessels. This operation concluded, they hastily clambered over her sides, sliding down the guy ropes to the ground. The last warrior to leave the deck turned and threw something back upon the vessel, waiting an instant to note the outcome of his act. As a faint spurt of flame rose from the point where the missile struck, he swung over the side and was quickly upon the ground. Scarcely had he alighted than the guy ropes were simultaneously released, and the great warship, lighted by the removal of the loot, soared majestically into the air, her decks and upper works a mass of roaring flames. Slowly, she drifted to the southeast, rising higher and higher as the flames ate away her wooden parts and diminished the weight upon her. Ascending to the roof of the building, I watched her for hours, until finally she was lost in the dim vistas of the distance. The sight was awe-inspiring in the extreme as one contemplated this mighty floating funeral pyre, drifting unguided and unmanned through the lonely wastes of the Martian heavens, a derelict of death and destruction, typifying the life story of these strange and ferocious creatures into whose unfriendly hands fate had carried it. Much depressed, and to me, unaccountably so, I slowly descended to the street. The scene I had witnessed seemed to mark the defeat and annihilation of the forces of a kindred people, rather than the routing by our green warriors of a horde of similar, though unfriendly, creatures. I could not fathom the seeming hallucination, nor could I free myself from it, but somewhere in the innermost recesses of my soul, I felt a strange yearning toward these unknown foemen, and a mighty hope surged through me that the fleet would return and demand a reckoning from the green warriors who had so ruthlessly and wantonly attacked it. Close at my heel, in his now accustomed place, followed Woola, the hound, and as I emerged upon the street, Sola rushed up to me as though I had been the object of some search on her part. The cavalcade was returning to the plaza, the homeward march having been given up for that day, nor, in fact, was it recommenced for more than a week owing to the fear of a return attack by the aircraft. Lorquas Tomo was too astute and an old warrior to be caught upon the open plains with a caravan of chariots and children, so we remained at the deserted city until the danger seemed past. As Sola and I entered the plaza, a sight met my eyes which filled my whole being with a great surge of mingled hope, fear, exaltation, and depression, and yet, most dominant, was a subtle sense of relief and happiness. For just as we neared the throng of Martians, I caught a glimpse of the prisoner from the battlecraft who was being roughly dragged into a nearby building by a couple of green Martian females. And the sight which met my eyes was that of a slender, girlish figure, similar in every detail to the earthly women of my past life. She did not see me at first, but just as she was disappearing through the portal of the building, which was to be her prison, she turned and her eyes met mine. Her face was oval and beautiful in the extreme. Her every feature was finely chiseled and exquisite. Her eyes large and lustrous, and her head surmounted by a mass of coal-black waving hair, caught loosely into a strange yet becoming coiffure. Her skin was of a light reddish copper color, against which the crimson glow of her cheeks and the ruby of her beautifully molded lip shone with a strangely enhancing effect. She was as destitute of clothes as the green Martians who accompanied her. Indeed, save for her highly wrought ornaments, she was entirely naked. Nor could any apparel have enhanced the beauty of her perfect 
and symmetrical figure. As her gaze rested on me, her eyes opened wide in astonishment, and she made a little sign with her hand, a sign which I did not, of course, understand. Just a moment we gazed upon each other, and then the look of hope and renewed courage which had glorified her face as she discovered me faded into one of utter dejection, mingled with loathing and contempt. I realized I had not answered her signal, and ignorant as I was of Martian customs, I intuitively felt that she had made an appeal for succor and protection, which my unfortunate ing ignorance had prevented me from answering. And then she was dragged out of my sight into the depths of the desert edifice. Chapter 9. I Learn the Language As I came back to myself, I glanced at Sola, who had witnessed this encounter, and I was surprised to note a strange expression upon her usually expressionless countenance. What her thoughts were I did not know, for as yet I had learned but little of the Martian tongue, enough only to suffice for my daily needs. As I reached the doorway of our building, a strange surprise awaited me. A warrior approached, bearing the arms, ornaments, and full accoutrements of his kind. These he presented to me with a few unintelligible words, and a bearing at once respectful and menacing. Later, Sola, with the aid of several of the other women, remodeled the trappings to fit my lesser proportions, and after they completed the work, I went about garbed in all the panoply of war. From then on, Sola instructed me in the mysteries of the various weapons, and with the Martian young I spent several hours each day practicing upon the plaza. I was not yet proficient with all the weapons, but my great familiarity with similar earthly weapons made me an unusually apt pupil, and I progressed in a very satisfactory manner. The training of myself and the young Martians was conducted solely by the women, who not only attend to the education of the young in the arts of individual defense and offense, but are also the artisans who produce every manufactured article wrought by the green Martians. They make the powder, the cartridges, the firearms, in fact, everything of value is produced by the females. In time of actual warfare, they form a part of the reserves, and when the necessity arises, fight with even greater intelligence and ferocity than the men. The men are trained in the higher branches of the art of war, in strategy and the maneuvering of large bodies of troops. They make the laws as they are needed, and a new law for each emergency. They are unfettered by a precedent in the administration of justice. Customs have been handed down by ages of repetition, but the punishment for ignoring a custom is a matter for individual treatment by a jury of the culprit's peers. And I may say that justice seldom misses fire, but seems rather to rule in inverse ratio to the ascendancy of law. In one respect, at least, the Martians are a happy people. They have no lawyers." I did not see the prisoner again for several days subsequent to our first encounter, and then only to catch a fleeting glimpse of her as she was being conducted to the great audience chamber where I had my first meeting with Lorcas Potomo. I could not but note the unnecessary harshness and brutality with which her guards treated her, so different from the almost maternal kindliness which Sola manifested toward me, and the respectful attitude of the green Martians who took the trouble to notice me at all. I had observed on the two occasions when I had seen her that the prisoner exchanged words with her guards, and this convinced me that they spoke, or at least could make themselves understood by a common language. With this added incentive, I nearly drove Sola distracted by my importunities to hasten on my education, and within a few more days I had mastered the Marston tongue sufficiently well to enable me to carry on a passable conversation and to fully understand practically all that I heard. At this time, our sleeping quarters were occupied by three or four females and a couple of the recently hatched young, besides Sola and her youthful ward, myself and Woola the hound. After they had retired for the night, it was customary for the adults to carry on a desultory conversation for a short time before lapsing into sleep, and now that I could understand their language, I was always a keen listener, although I never proffered any remarks myself. On the night following the prisoner's visit to the audience chamber, the conversation finally fell upon this subject, and I was all ears on the instant. I had feared to question Sola relative to the beautiful captive, as I could not but recall the strange expression I had noted upon her face after my first encounter with the prisoner. That it denoted jealousy I could not say, and yet, judging all things by mundane standards as I still did, I felt it safer to affect indifference in the matter until I learned more surely Sola's attitude toward the object of my solicitude. Sarkoja, one of the older women who shared our domicile, had been present at the audience as one of the captive's guards, and it was towards her the question turned. When, asked one of the women, will we enjoy the death throes of the Red One, or does Lorquas Tomo, Jed, intend holding her for ransom? 
They have decided to carry her with us back to Thark and exhibit her last agonies at the great games before Tal Hajas, replied Sarkoja. What will be the manner of her going out? inquired Sola. She is very small and very beautiful. I had hoped they would hold her for ransom. Sarkoja and the other women grunted angrily at this evidence of weakness on the part of Sola. It is sad, Sola, that you were not born a million years ago, snapped Sarkoja, when all the hollows of the land were filled with water and the peoples were as soft as the stuff they sailed upon. In our day we have progressed to a point where such sentiments mark weakness and atavism. It will not be well for you to permit Tars Tarkas to learn that you hold such degenerate sentiments, as I doubt that he would care to entrust such as you with the grave responsibilities of maternity. I see nothing wrong with my expression of interest in this red woman, retorted Sola. She has never harmed us, nor would she, should we have fallen into her hands. It is only the men of her kind who war upon us, and I have ever thought that their attitude towards us is but the reflection of ours towards them. They live at peace with all their fellows except when duty calls upon them to make war, while we are at peace with none, forever warring among our own kind as well as upon the red men, and even our own communities the individuals fight among themselves. Oh, it is one continual awful period of bloodshed from the time we break the shell until we gladly embrace the bosom of the river of mystery, the dark and ancient is which carries us to an unknown but at least no more frightful and terrible existence." Fortunate indeed is he who meets his end in an early death. Say what you please, Atars Tarkas. He can mete out no worse fate to me than a continuation of the horrible existence we are forced to lead in this life. This wild outbreak on the part of Sola so greatly surprised and shocked the other women that, after a few words of general reprimand, they all lapsed into silence and we were soon asleep. One thing the episode had accomplished was to assure me of Sola's friendliness toward the poor girl, and also to convince me that I had been extremely fortunate in falling into her hands rather than those of some of the other females. I knew that she was fond of me, and now that I had discovered that she hated cruelty and barbarity, I was confident that I could depend upon her to aid me and the girl captive to escape, provided, of course, that such a thing was within the range of possibilities." I did not even know that there were any better conditions to escape to, but I was more than willing to take my chances among people fashioned after my own mold, rather than remain longer among the hideous and bloodthirsty green men of Mars. But where to go, and how, was as much of a puzzle to me as the age-old search for the spring of eternal life has been to earthly men since the beginning of time. I decided that at the first opportunity I would take Sola into my confidence and openly ask her to aid me, and with this resolution strong upon me, turned among my silks and furs and slept the dreamless and refreshing sleep of Mars. Chapter 10. Champion and Chief Early the next morning, I was astir. Considerable freedom was allowed me, as Sola had informed me that so long as I did not attempt to leave the city, I was free to go and come as I pleased. She had warned me, however, against venturing forth unarmed, as this city, like all other deserted metropolises of an ancient Martian civilization, was peopled by the great white apes of my second day's adventure. In advising me that I must not leave the boundaries of the city, Sola had explained that Wula would prevent this anyway should I attempt it, and she warned me most urgently not to arouse his fierce nature by ignoring his warning should I venture too close to the forbidden territory. His nature was such, she said, that he would bring me back into the city dead or alive should I persist in opposing him, preferably dead, she added. On this morning, I had chosen a new street to explore when suddenly I found myself at the limits of the city. Before me were low hills pierced by narrow and inviting ravines. I longed to explore the country before me, and, like the pioneer stock from which I sprang, to view the, what the landscape beyond the encircling hills might disclose from the summits which shut out my view. It also occurred to me that this would prove an excellent opportunity to test the qualities of Wula. I was convinced that the brute loved me. I had seen more evidences of affection in him than in any other Martian animal, man or beast, and I was sure that gratitude for the acts that had twice saved his life would more than outweigh his loyalty to the duty imposed upon him by cruel and loveless masters. As I approached the boundary line, Wula ran anxiously before me and thrust his body against my legs. His expression was pleading rather than ferocious, nor did he bear his great tusks or utter his fearful guttural warnings. 
Denied the friendship and companionship of my kind, I had developed considerable affection for Wula and Sola, for the normal earthly man must have some outlet for his natural affections, and so I decided upon an appeal to a like instinct in this great brute, sure that I would not be disappointed. I had never petted nor fondled him, but now I sat upon the ground, and putting my arms around his heavy neck, I stroked and coaxed him, talking in my newly acquired Martian tongue as I would have to my hound at home, as I would have talked to any other friend among the lower animals. His response to my manifestation of affection was remarkable to a degree. He stretched his great mouth to its full width, bearing the entire expanse of his upper rows of tusks, and wrinkling his snout until his great eyes were almost hidden by the folds of flesh. If you have ever seen a collie smile, you may have some idea of Wula's facial distortion. He threw himself upon his back and fairly wallowed at my feet, jumped up and sprang upon me, rolling me upon the ground by his great weight, then wriggling and squirming around me like a playful puppy presenting its back for the petting it craves. I could not resist the ludicrousness of the spectacle, and holding my sides, I rocked back and forth in the first laughter which had passed my lips in many days. The first, in fact, since the morning Powell had left camp when his horse, long unused, had precipitately and unexpectedly bucked him off, head foremost, into a pot of frijoles. My laughter frightened Wula. His antics ceased, and he crawled pitifully toward me, poking his ugly head far into my lap, and then I remembered what laughter signified on Mars. Torture. Suffering. Death. Quieting myself, I rubbed the poor old fellow's head and back and talked to him for a few minutes, and then, in an authoritative tone, commanded him to follow me, and arising, started for the hills. There was no further question of authority between us. Wula was my devoted slave from that moment hence, and I his only and undisputed master. My walk to the hills occupied but a few minutes, and I found nothing of particular interest to reward me. Numerous brilliantly colored and strangely formed wildflowers dotted the ravines, and from the summit of the first hill I saw still other hills stretching off toward the north and rising, one range above another, until lost in the mountains of quite respectable dimensions, though I afterward found that only a few peaks on all of Mars exceed 4,000 feet in height. The suggestion of magnitude was merely relative." My morning's walk had been large with importance to me, for it had resulted in a perfect understanding with Wula, upon whom Tars Tarkas relied for my safekeeping. I now knew that while theoretically a prisoner, I was virtually free, and I hastened to regain the city limits before the defection of Wula could be discovered by his erstwhile masters. The adventure decided me never again to leave the limits of my prescribed stamping grounds until I was ready to venture forth for good and all, as it would certainly result in the curtailment of my liberties, as well as the probable death of Wula, were we to be discovered. On regaining the plaza, I had my third glimpse of the captive girl. She was standing with her guards before the entrance to the audience chamber, and as I approached she gave me one haughty glance and turned her back full upon me. The act was so womanly, so earthly womanly, that though it stung my pride, it also warmed my heart with a feeling of companionship. It was good to know that someone else on Mars beside myself had human instincts of a civilized order, even though the manifestation of them was so painful and mortifying. Had a green Martian woman decided to show dislike or contempt, she would, in all likelihood, have done it with a sword thrust or a movement of her trigger finger— but as their sentiments are mostly atrophied, it would have required serious injury to have aroused such passions in them. Sola, let me add, was an exception. I never saw her perform a cruel or uncouth act, or fail in uniform kindliness and good nature. She was indeed, as her fellow Martian had said of her, an atavism, a dear and precious reversion to a former type of loved and loving ancestor. Seeing that the prisoner seemed the center of attraction, I halted to view the proceedings. I had not long to wait, for presently, Lorquars Tomal and his retinue of chieftains approached the building and, signing the guards to follow with the prisoner, entered the audience chamber. Realizing that I was a somewhat favored character, and also convinced that the warriors did not know of my proficiency in their language, as I had pled with Sola to keep this a secret on the grounds that I did not wish to be forced to talk with the men until I had perfectly mastered the Martian tongue, I chanced an attempt to enter the audience chamber and listen to the proceedings. The council squatted upon the steps of the rostrum, while below them stood the prisoner and her two guards. I saw that one of the women was Sarkoja, and thus understood how she had been present at the hearing of the preceding day, the results of which she had reported to the occupants of our dormitory last night. Her attitude toward the captive was most harsh and brutal. When she held her, she sunk her rudimentary nails into the poor girl's flesh, or twisted her arm in a most painful manner. 
When it was necessary to move from one spot to the other, she either jerked her roughly or pushed her headlong before her. She seemed to be venting upon this poor defenseless creature all the hatred, cruelty, ferocity, in spite of her nine hundred years, backed by unguessable ages of fierce and brutal ancestors. The other woman was less cruel because she was entirely indifferent. If the prisoner had been left to her alone, and fortunately she was at night, she would have received no harsh treatment, nor, by the same token, would she have received any attention at all. As Lorquas Tomo raised his eyes to address the prisoner, they fell on me, and he turned to Tars Tarkas with a word and gesture of impatience. Tars Tarkas made some reply which I could not catch, but which caused Lorquas Tomo to smile, after which they paid no further attention to me. "'What is your name?' asked Lorquas Tomo, addressing the prisoner. Deha Thoris, daughter of Mors Kajak of Helium. And the nature of your expedition, he continued. It was a purely scientific research party sent out by my father's father, the Jadak of Helium, to rechart the air currents and to take atmospheric density tests, replied the fair prisoner in a low, well-modulated voice. We were unprepared for battle, she continued. As we were on a peaceful mission, as our banners and the colors of our craft denoted, the work we were doing was as much in your interest as in ours, for you know full well that were it not for our labors and the fruits of our scientific operations, there would not be enough air or water on Mars to support a single human life. For ages we have maintained the air and water supply at practically the same point without an appreciable loss, and we have done this in the face of the brutal and ignorant interference of you green men." Why, oh why, will you not learn to live in amity with your fellows? Must you ever go down the ages to your final extinction but little above the plane of the dumb brutes that serve you? A people without written language, without art, without homes, without love, the victims of eons of the horrible community idea, owning everything in common, even to your women and children, has resulted in your owning nothing in common. You hate each other as you hate all else except yourselves." Come back to the ways of our common ancestors. Come back to the light of kindliness and fellowship. The way is open to you. You will find the hands of the red men stretched out to aid you. Together, we may still do more to regenerate our dying planet. The granddaughter of the greatest and mightiest of the red Jedax has asked you. Will you come? Lorquas Tomo and the warriors sat looking silently and intently at the young woman for several moments after she had ceased speaking. What was passing in their minds no man may know, but that they were moved, I truly believe, and if one man high among them had been strong enough to rise above custom, that moment would have marked a new and mighty era for Mars. I saw Tars Tarkas rise to speak, and on his face was such an expression as I had never seen upon the countenance of a green Martian warrior. It bespoke an inward and mighty battle with self, with heredity, with age-old custom, and as he opened his mouth to speak— a look almost of benignity, of kindliness, momentarily lighted up his fierce and terrible countenance. What words of moment were to have fallen from his lips were never spoken, as just then a young warrior, evidently sensing the trend of thought among the older men, leaped down from the steps of the rostrum, and striking the frail captive a powerful blow across the face which felled her to the floor, placed his foot upon her prostrate form, and turning toward the assembled council, broke into peals of horrid, mirthless laughter. For an instant, I thought Tars Tarkas would strike him dead. Nor did the aspect of Lorquas Tomo argue any too favorably for the brute, but the mood passed. Their old selves reasserted their ascendancy, and they smiled. It was portentous, however, that they did not laugh aloud, for the brute's act constituted a side-splitting witticism according to the ethics which rule green Martian humor. That I have taken moments to write down a part of what occurred as that blow fell did not signify that I remained inactive for any such length of time. I think I must have sensed something of what was coming, for I realize now that I was crouched as for a spring as I saw the blow aimed at her beautiful, upturned, pleading face, and ere the hand descended I was halfway across the hall. Scarcely had his hideous laugh rang out but once when I was upon him. The brute was twelve feet in height and armed to the teeth, but I believe that I could have accounted for the whole roomful in the terrific intensity of my rage. Springing upward, I struck him full in the face as he turned at my warning cry, and then as he drew his short sword, I drew mine and sprang again 
upon his breast, hooking one leg over the butt of his pistol and grasping one of his huge tusks with my left hand while I delivered blow after blow upon his enormous chest. He could not use his short sword to advantage because I was too close to him, nor could he draw his pistol, which he attempted to do in direct opposition to Martian custom, which says that you may not fight a fellow warrior in private combat with any other than the weapon with which you are attacked. In fact, he could do nothing but make a wild and futile attempt to dislodge me. With all his immense bulk, he was little, if any stronger than I, and it was but the matter of a moment or two before he sank, bleeding and lifeless, to the floor. Deha Thoris had raised herself upon one elbow and was watching the battle with wide, staring eyes. When I had regained my feet, I raised her in my arms and bore her to one of the benches at the side of the room. Again, no Martian interfered with me, and tearing a piece of silk from my cape, I endeavored to staunch the flow of blood from her nostrils. I was soon successful, as her injuries amounted to little more than an ordinary nosebleed, and when she could speak, she placed her hand upon my arm, and looking up into my eyes, said, "'Why did you do it? You, who refused me even a friendly recognition in the first hour of my peril, and now you risked your life and kill one of your companions for my sake?' "'I cannot understand.' What strange manner of man are you, that you consort with the green men, though your form is that of my race, while your color is little darker than that of a white ape? Tell me, are you human, or are you more than human? It is a strange tale, I replied, too long to attempt to tell you now, and one which I so much doubt the credibility of myself, that I fear to hope that others will believe it. Suffice it for the present that I am your friend." and, so far as our captors will permit, your protector and your servant. Then you too are a prisoner. But why, then, those arms and the regalia of the Tharkian chieftain? What is your name? Where is your country? Yes, De Hathoris, I too am a prisoner. My name is John Carter, and I claim Virginia, one of the United States of America, Earth, as my home. But why I am permitted to wear arms I do not know— nor was I aware that my regalia was that of a chieftain. We were interrupted at this juncture by the approach of one of the warriors, bearing arms, accoutrements, and ornaments, and in a flash one of her questions was answered and a puzzle cleared up for me. I saw that the body of my dead antagonist had been stripped, and I read in the menacing yet respectful attitude of the warrior who had brought me these trophies of the kill the same demeanor as that evidenced by the other who had brought me my original equipment— And now, for the first time, I realized that my blow, on the occasion of my first battle in the audience chamber, had resulted in the death of my adversary. The reason for the whole attitude displayed toward me was now apparent. I had won my spurs, so to speak, and in the crude justice which always marks Martian dealings, and which, among other things, has caused me to call her the planet of paradoxes, I was accorded the honors due a conqueror, the trappings, and the position of the man I killed. In truth... I was a Martian chieftain, and this I learned later was the cause of my great freedom and my toleration in the audience chamber. As I had turned to receive the dead warrior's chattels, I had noticed that Tars Tarkas and several others had pushed forward towards us, and the eyes of the former rested upon me in a most quizzical manner. Finally, he addressed me. "'You speak the tongue of Barsoom quite readily for one who was deaf and dumb to us a few short days ago. Where did you learn it, John Carter?' "'You yourself are responsible, Tars Tarkas,' I replied, "'in that you furnish me with an instructress of remarkable ability. "'I have to thank Sola for my learning.' "'She has done well,' he answered. "'But your education in other respects needs considerable polish. "'Do you know what your unprecedented temerity would have cost you "'had you failed to kill either of the two chieftains whose medal you now wear?' "'I presume that the one whom I... "'had failed to kill, would have killed me,' I answered, smiling. "'No, you are wrong. "'Only in the last extremity of self-defense would a Martian warrior kill a prisoner. "'We like to save them for other purposes.' "'And his face bespoke possibilities that were not pleasant to dwell upon. "'But one thing can save you now,' he continued. "'Should you, in recognition of your remarkable valor, ferocity, and prowess, "'be considered by tall Hajas as worthy of his service, "'you may be taken into the community and become a full-fledged Tharkian. "'Until we reach the headquarters of tall Hajas, "'it is the will of Lorquas Tomo that you be accorded the respect your acts have earned you. "'You will be treated by us as a Tharkian chieftain, "'but you must not forget that every chief who ranks you "'is responsible for your safe delivery to our mighty and most ferocious ruler.' 
I am done. I hear you, Tars Tarkas, I answered. As you know, I am not Barsoom. Your ways are not my ways, and I can only act in the future as I have in the past in accordance with the dictates of my conscience and guided by the standards of my own people. If you will leave me alone, I will go in peace. But if not, let the individual Barsoomians with whom I must deal either respect my rights as a stranger among you or take whatever consequences may befall. Of one thing let us be sure— Whatever may be your ultimate intentions towards this unfortunate young woman, whoever would offer to injure her or insult in the future must figure on making a full accounting to me. I understand that you belittle all sentiments of generosity and kindliness, but I do not, and I can convince your most doughty warrior that these characteristics are not incompatible with an ability to fight. Ordinarily, I'm not given to long speeches, nor ever before had I descended to bombast, but I had guessed at the keynote which would strike an answering chord in the breasts of the green Martians, nor was I wrong. For my harangue evidently deeply impressed them, and their attitude toward me thereafter was still further respectful. Tars Targus himself seemed pleased with my reply, but his only comment was more or less enigmatical. And I think I know Tal Hajas Jadak of Thark. I now turned my attention to Deha Thoras, and assisting her to her feet, I turned with her toward the exit, ignoring her hovering guardian harpies as well as the inquiring glances of the chieftains. Was I not now a chieftain also? Well, then I would assume the responsibilities of one. They did not molest us, and so Deha Thoras, princess of Helium, and John Carter, gentleman of Virginia, followed by the faithful Wula, passed through utter silence from the audience chamber of Lorquas Tomol Jed among the Tharks of Barsoom. Chapter 11 With Deja Thoris As we reached the open, the two female guards who had been detailed to watch over Deja Thoris hurried up and made as though to assume custody of her once more. The poor child shrank against me, and I felt her two little hands fold tightly over my arm. Waving the women away, I informed them that Sola would attend to the captive hereafter, and I further warned Sarkoja that any more of her cruel intentions bestowed upon Deja Thoris would result in Sarkoja's sudden and painful demise. My threat was unfortunate, and resulted in more harm than good to Deja Thoris, for, as I learned later, men do not kill women upon Mars, nor women men, so Sarkoja merely gave us an ugly look and departed to hatch up deviltries against us. I soon found Sola and explained to her that I wished her to guard Deja Thoris as she had guarded me, that I wished her to find other quarters where they would not be molested by Sarkoja, and I finally informed her that I myself would take up my quarters among the men. Sola glanced at the accoutrements which were carried in my hand and slung across my shoulder. You are a great chieftain now, John Carter, she said, and I must do your bidding, though indeed I am glad to do it under any circumstances. The man whose medal you carry was young, but he was a great warrior, had, by his promotions and kills, won his way close to the rank of Tars Tarkas, who, as you know, is second to Lorcas Tommel only. You are eleventh. There are but ten chieftains in this community who rank you in prowess. And if I should kill Lorcas Tommel, I asked? You would be first, John Carter. But you may only win that honor by the will of the entire council that Lorcas Tommel meet you in combat or should he attack you, you may kill him in self-defense, and thus win first place. I laughed and changed the subject. I had no particular desire to kill Lorcas Tommel, and less to be a jed among the Tharks. I accompanied Sola and Deja Thoris in a search for new quarters, which we found in a building nearer the audience chamber, in a far more pretentious architecture than our former habitation. We also found in this building real sleeping apartments, with ancient beds of highly wrought metal, swinging from enormous gold chains depending from the marble ceilings. The decoration of the walls was most elaborate, and unlike the frescoes in the other buildings I had examined, portrayed many human figures in their compositions. These were of people like myself, and of a much lighter color than Deja Thoris. They were clad in graceful flowing robes, highly ornamented with metal and jewels, and their luxuriant hair was of beautiful golden reddish bronze. The men were beardless, and only a few wore arms. The scenes depicted, for the most part, a fair-skinned, fair-haired people at play. Dejah Thoris clasped her hands with an exclamation of rapture 
as she gazed upon these magnificent works of art, wrought by people long extinct, while Sola, on the other hand, apparently did not see them. We decided to use this room, on the second floor, and overlooking the plaza, for Dejah Thoris and Sola, and another room adjoining and in the rear for the cooking and supplies. I then dispatched Sola to bring the bedding and such food and utensils as she might need, telling her that I would guard Dejah Thoris until her return. As Sola departed, Dejah Thoris turned to me with a faint smile. And where to then would your prisoner escape should you leave her, unless it was to follow you and crave your protection, and ask your pardon for the cruel thoughts she has harbored against you these past few days? You're right, I answered. There's no escape for either of us unless we go together. I heard your challenge to the creature you call Tars Tarkas, and I think I understand your position among these people. But what I cannot fathom is your statement that you are not of Barsoom. In the name of my first ancestor, then, she continued, where may you be from? You are like unto my people, and yet so unlike. You speak my language, and yet I heard you tell Tars Tarkas that you had but learned it recently. All Barsoomians speak the same tongue, from the ice-clad south to the ice-clad north, though their written languages differ. Only in the valley door, where the river Is empties into the lost sea of Chorus, is there supposed to be a different language spoken. And, except in the legends of our ancestors, there is no record of a Barsoomian returning up the river Is from the shores of Chorus in the valley of Dor. Do not tell me that you have thus returned. They would kill you horribly anywhere upon the surface of Barsoom if that were true. Tell me it is not. Her eyes were filled with a strange, weird light. Her voice was pleading, and her little hands reached up upon my breast, or pressed against me, as though to wring a denial from my very heart. I do not know your customs, Dejah Thoris, but in my own Virginia a gentleman does not lie to save himself. I am not of door. I have never seen the mysterious Is. The lost sea of Chorus is still lost, so far as I am concerned. Do you believe me? And then it struck me suddenly that I was very anxious that she should believe me. It was not that I feared the results which would follow a general belief that I had returned from the Barsoomian heaven or hell or whatever it was. Why was it then? Why should I care what she thought? I looked down at her, her beautiful face upturned, and her wonderful eyes opening up the very depth of her soul. And as my eyes met hers, I knew why, and I shuddered. A similar wave of feeling seemed to stir her. She drew away from me with a sigh, and with her earnest, beautiful face turned up to mine, she whispered, I believe you, John Carter. I do not know what a gentleman is, nor have I ever heard before of Virginia. But on Barsoom, no man lies. If he does not wish to speak the truth, he is silent. Where is this Virginia, your country, John Carter? She asked, and it seemed that this fair name of my fair land had never sounded more beautiful than as it fell from those perfect lips on that far-gone day. I'm of another world, I answered. The great planet Earth, which revolves around our common sun and next within the orbit of your Barsoom, which we know as Mars. How I came here I cannot tell you, for I do not know, but here I am, and since my presence has permitted me to serve Dejah Thoris, I am glad that I am here. She gazed at me with troubled eyes, long and questioningly. That it was difficult to believe my statement I well knew, nor could I hope that she would do so however much I craved her confidence and respect. I would much rather not have told her anything of my antecedents, but no man could look into the depths of those eyes and refuse her slightest behest. Finally she smiled and, rising, said, I shall have to believe, even though I cannot understand. I can readily perceive that you are not of the Barsoom of today. You are like us, yet different. But why should I trouble my poor head with such a problem when my heart tells me that I believe because I wish to believe? It was good logic, good earthly feminine logic, and if it satisfied her, I certainly could pick no flaws in it. As a matter of fact, it was about the only kind of logic that could be brought to bear upon my problem. We fell into general conversation then, asking and answering many questions on each side. She was curious to learn of the customs of my people, and displayed a remarkable knowledge of events on earth. When I questioned her closely on this seeming familiarity with earthly things, she laughed and cried out, 
Why, every school by Anbarsoom knows the geography, and much concerning the fauna and flora, as well as the history of your planet, fully as well as his own. Can we not see everything which takes place upon Earth, as you call it? Is it not hanging there in the heavens in plain sight? It has baffled me, I must confess, fully as much as my statements had confounded her, and I told her so. She then explained, in general, the instruments her people had used and been perfecting for ages, which permit them to throw upon a screen a perfect image of what is transpiring upon any planet and upon many of the stars. These pictures are so perfect in detail that, when photographed and enlarged, objects no greater than a blade of grass may be distinctly recognized. I afterward, in helium, saw many of these pictures, as well as the instruments which produced them. If, then, you are so familiar with earthly things, I asked, why is it that you do not recognize me as identical with the inhabitants of that planet? She smiled again, as one might in bored indulgence of a questioning child. Because, John Carter, she replied, nearly every planet and star having atmospheric conditions at all approaching those of Barsoom shows forms of animal life almost identical with you and me. And further, Earthmen, almost without exception, cover their bodies with strange, unsightly pieces of cloth, and their heads with hideous contraptions of purpose of which we have unable to conceive. While you, when found by the Tharkian warriors, were entirely undisfigured and unadorned. The fact that you wore no ornaments was a strong proof of your unbarsoomian origin, while the absence of grotesque coverings might cause a doubt as to your earthliness. I then narrated the details of my departure from the earth, explaining that my body there lay fully clothed in the, to her, strange garments of mundane dwellers. At this point, Sola returned with our meager belongings and her young Martian protege, who, of course, would have to share the quarters with them. Sola asked us if we had a visitor during her absence, and seemed much surprised when we answered in the negative. It seemed that as she had mounted the approach to the upper floors where our quarters were located, she had met Sarkoja descending. We decided she must have been eavesdropping, but as we could recall nothing of importance that had passed between us, we dismissed the matters of little consequence, merely promising ourselves to be warned to the utmost caution in the future. Dejathoris and I then fell to examining the architecture and decorations of the beautiful chambers of the building we were occupying. She told me that these people had presumably flourished over a hundred thousand years before. They were the early progenitors of her race, but had mixed with the other great race of early Martians, who were very dark, almost black, and also with the reddish-yellow race, which had flourished at the same time. These three great divisions of the higher Martians had been forced into a mighty alliance, as the drying up of the Martian seas had compelled them to seek the comparatively few and always diminishing fertile areas, and to defend themselves under new conditions of life against the wild hordes of green men. Ages of close relationship and intermarrying had resulted in the race of red men, of which Dejah Thoris was a fair and beautiful daughter. During the ages of hardships and incessant warring between their own various races, as well as with the green men, before they had fitted themselves to the changed conditions, much of the high civilization and many of the arts of the fair-haired Martians had become lost. But the red race of today had reached a point where it feels that it has made up in new discoveries and in a more practical civilization for all that lies irretrievably buried within the ancient Barsoomians, beneath the countless intervening ages. These ancient Martians had been a highly cultivated and literary race, but during the vicissitudes of those trying centuries of readjustment to new conditions, not only did their advancement and production cease entirely, but practically all their archives, records, and literature were lost. Dejah Thoris related many interesting facts and legends concerning this lost race of noble and kindly people. She said the city in which we were camping was supposed to have been a center of commerce and culture known as Korad. It had been built upon a beautiful natural harbor, landlocked by magnificent hills. The little valley on the west front of the city, she explained, was all that remained of the harbor, while the pass through the hills to the old sea bottom had been the channel through which the shipping passed up to the city gates. The shores of the ancient seas were dotted with just such cities, and lesser ones, in diminishing numbers, were to be found converging towards the center of the oceans, as the people had found it necessary to follow the receding waters until necessity had forced upon them their ultimate salvation, the so-called 
Martian canals. We had been so engrossed in exploration of the building and in our conversation that it was late in the afternoon before we realized it. We were brought back to a realization of our present conditions by a messenger bearing a summons from Lorcus Tommel, directing me to appear before him forthwith. Bidding Dejah Thoris and Sola farewell, and commanding Wula to remain on guard, I hastened to the audience chamber, where I found Lorcus Tommel and Tars Tarkas seated upon the rostrum. Chapter 12 A Prisoner with Power As I entered and saluted, Lorcus Tommel signaled me to advance, and fixing his great hideous eyes upon me, addressed me thus. You have been with us a few days, yet during that time you have by your prowess won a high position among us. Be that as it may, you are not one of us, and you owe us no allegiance. Your position is a peculiar one, he continued. You are a prisoner, and yet you give commands which must be obeyed. You are an alien, and yet you are a Tharkian chieftain. You are a midget, and yet you can kill a mighty warrior with one blow of your fist. And now, you're reported to have been plotting to escape with another prisoner of another race, a prisoner who, from her own admission, half believes you are returned from the Valley of Dor. Either one of these accusations, if proved, would be sufficient grounds for your execution. But we are a just people, and shall have a trial on our return to Thark, if Tal Hedges so commands. But, he continued, in his fierce guttural tones, if you run off with the Red Girl, it is I who shall have to account to Tal Hedges. It is I who shall have to face Tars Tarkas, and either demonstrate my right to command, or the metal from my dead carcass will go to a better man, for such is the custom of the Tharks. I have no quarrel with Tars Tarkas. Together we rule supreme, the greatest of the lesser communities among the green men. We do not wish to fight between ourselves, and so, if you were dead, John Carter, I should be glad. Under two conditions only, however, may you be killed by us without orders from Tal Hadges. In personal combat and self-defense, should you attack one of us, or were you apprehended in an attempt to escape? As a matter of justice, I must warn you that we only await one of these two excuses for ridding ourselves of so great a responsibility. The safe delivery of the Red Girl to Tal Hadges is of the greatest importance. Not in a thousand years have the Tharks made such a capture. She is the granddaughter of the greatest of the Red Jeddaks, who is also our bitterest enemy. I have spoken. The Red Girl told us you were without the softer sentiments of humanity, but we are a just and truthful race. You may go. Turning, I left the audience chamber. So this was the beginning of Sarkoja's persecution. I knew that none other could be responsible for this report, which had reached the ears of Lorcus Tommel so quickly. And now I recalled those portions of our conversation which had touched upon escape and upon my origin. Sarkoja was at this time Tars Tarkas's oldest and most trusted female. As such, she was a mighty power behind the throne, for no warrior had the confidence of Lorcus Tommel to such an extent as his ablest lieutenant, Tars Tarkas. However, instead of putting thoughts of possible escape from my mind, my audience with Lorcus Tommel only served to center my every faculty on this subject. Now more than ever before, the absolute necessity for escape, insofar as Dejah Thoris was concerned, was impressed upon me, for I was convinced that some horrible fate awaited her at the headquarters of Tal Hadges. As described by Sola, this monster was the exaggerated personification of all the ages of cruelty, ferocity, and brutality from which he had descended. Cold, cunning, calculating, he was also, in marked contrast to most of his fellows, a slave to that brute passion which the waning demands for procreation upon their dying planet has almost stilled in the Martian breast. The thought of that divine Dejah Thoris might fall into the clutches of such an abysmal atavism started the cold sweat upon me. Far better that we save friendly bullets for ourselves in the last moment, as did those brave frontier women of my lost land, who took their own lives rather than fall into the hands of the Indian braves. As I wandered about the plaza, lost in my gloomy forebodings, Tars Tarkas approached me on his way from the audience chamber. His demeanor towards me was unchanged, and he greeted me 
as though we had not just parted a few moments before. Where are your quarters, John Carter? he asked. I have selected none, I replied. It seemed best that I quartered either by myself or among the other warriors, and I was awaiting an opportunity to ask your advice. As you know, and I smiled, I'm not yet familiar with all the customs of the Tharks. Come with me, he directed, and together we moved off across the plaza to a building which I was glad to see adjoined that occupied by Sola and her charges. My quarters on the first floor of this building, he said, and the second floor also was fully occupied by warriors. But the third floor and the floors above are vacant. You may take your choice of these. I understand, he continued, that you've given up your woman to the red prisoner. Well, as you have said, your ways are not our ways, but you can fight well enough to do about as you please. And so, if you wish to give your woman to a captive, it is your own affair. But as a chieftain, you should have those to serve you. In accordance with our customs, you may select any or all the females from the retinues of the chieftains whose medal you now wear. I thanked him, but assured him I could get along very nicely without assistance, except in the matter of preparing food. And so he promised to send women to me for this purpose, and also for the care of my arms and the manufacture of my ammunition, which he said would be necessary. I suggested they might also bring some of the sleeping silks and furs which belonged to me as spoils of combat, for the nights were cold and I had none of my own. He promised to do so and departed. Left alone, I ascended the winding corridor to the upper floors in search of suitable quarters. The beauties of the other buildings were repeated in this, and as usual, I was soon lost in a tour of investigation and discovery. I finally chose a front room on the third floor, because this brought me nearer to Dejah Thoris whose apartment was on the second floor of the adjoining building, and it flashed upon me that I could rig up some means of communication, whereby she might signal me in case she needed either my services or my protection. Adjoining my sleeping apartments were baths, dressing rooms, and other sleeping and living apartments, in all some ten rooms on this floor. The windows of the back rooms overlooked an enormous court, which formed the center of the square made by the buildings, faced the four contiguous streets, which was now given over to the quartering of the various animals belonging to the warriors occupying the adjoining buildings. While the court was entirely overgrown with the yellow, moss-like vegetation, which blankets practically the entire surface of Mars, yet numerous fountains, statuary, benches, and pergola-like contraptions bore witness to the beauty which the court must have presented in bygone times, when graced by the fair-haired, laughing people, whom stern and unalterable cosmic laws had driven not only from their homes, but from all except the vague legends of their descendants. One could easily picture the gorgeous foliage of the luxuriant Martian vegetation, which once filled this scene with life and color, the graceful figures of the beautiful women, the straight and handsome men, the happy, frolicking children, all sunlight, happiness, and peace. It was difficult to realize that they had gone, down through the ages of darkness, cruelty, and ignorance, until their hereditary instincts of culture and humanitarianism had risen ascendant once more in the final composite race, which is now dominant upon Mars. My thoughts were cut short by the advent of several young females bearing loads of weapons, silks, furs, jewels, cooking utensils, and casks of food and drink, including considerable loot from the aircraft. All this, it seemed, had been the property of the two chieftains I had slain, and now, by the customs of the Tharks, it had become mine. At my direction they placed the stuff in one of the back rooms, and then departed, only to return with a second load, which they advised me constituted the balance of my goods. On the second trip, they were accompanied by ten or fifteen other women and youths, who, it seemed, formed the retinues of the two chieftains. They were not their families, nor their wives, nor their servants, the relationship was peculiar, and so unlike anything known to us that it is most difficult to describe. All property among the green Martians is owned in common by the community, except the personal weapons, ornaments, and sleeping silks and furs of the individuals. These alone can one claim undisputed rights to. Nor may he accumulate more of these than are required for his actual needs. The surplus he holds merely as custodian, and it is passed on to the younger members of the community, as necessity demands. 
the women and children of a man's retinue may be likened to a military unit, for which he is responsible in various ways, as in matters of instruction, discipline, sustenance, and the exigencies of their continual roamings and their unending strife with the other communities and with the Red Martians. His women are in no sense wives. The Green Martians use no word corresponding in meeting with this earthly word. Their mating is a matter of community interest solely, and is directed without reference to natural selection. The Council of Chieftains control the matter as surely as the owner of a Kentucky racing stud directs the scientific breeding of his stock for the improvement of the whole. In theory, it may sound well, as is often the case with theories, but the results of ages of this unnatural practice, coupled with the community interest in the offspring being held paramount to that of the mother, is shown in the cold, cruel creatures and their gloomy, loveless, mirthless existence. It is true the Green Martians are absolutely virtuous, both men and women, with the exception of such degenerates as Tal Hadges. But better far, a finer balance of human characteristics, even at the expense of a slight and occasional loss of chastity. Finding that I must assume responsibility for these creatures, whether I would or not, I made the best of it and directed them to find quarters on the upper floors, leaving the third floor to me. One of the girls I charged with the duties of my simple cuisine and directed the others to take up the various activities which had formerly constituted their vocations. Thereafter, I saw little of them, nor did I care to. Chapter 13 Love Making on Mars Following the battle with the airships, the community remained within the city for several days, abandoning the homeward march until they could feel reasonably assured the ships would not return. For to be caught on the open plains with a cavalcade of chariots and children was far from the desire of even so warlike a people as the Green Martians. During our period of inactivity, Tars Tarkas had instructed me in many of the customs and arts of war familiar to the Tharks, including lessons in riding and guiding the great beasts which bore the warriors. These creatures, which are known as thoats, are as dangerous and vicious as their masters, but when once subdued are sufficiently tractable for the purposes of the Green Martians. Two of these animals had fallen to me from the warriors whose metal I wore, and in a short time I could handle them quite as well as the native warriors. The method was not at all complicated. If the thoats did not respond with sufficient celerity to the telepathic instructions of their riders, they were dealt a terrific blow between the ears with the butt of a pistol. And if they showed fight, this treatment was continued, to the brutes either were subdued or had unseated their riders. In the latter case, it became a life-and-death struggle between the man and the beast. If the former were quick enough with his pistol, he might live to ride again, though upon some other beast. If not, his torn and mangled body was gathered up by his women and burned in accordance with Tharkian custom. My experience with Wula determined me to attempt the experiment of kindness in my treatment of my thoats. First I taught them that they could not unseat me, and even wrapped them sharply between the ears to impress upon them my authority and mastery. Then, by degrees, I won their confidence in much the same manner as I had adopted countless times with my many mundane mounts. I was ever a good hand with animals, and by inclination, as well because it brought more lasting and satisfactory results, I was always kind and humane in my dealings with the lower orders. I could take a human life, if necessary, with far less compunction than that of a poor, unreasoning, irresponsible brute. In the course of a few days, my thoats were the wonder of the entire community. They would follow me like dogs, rubbing their great snouts against my body in awkward evidence of affection, and respond to my every command with an alacrity and docility which caused the Martian warriors to ascribe to me the possession of some earthly power unknown on Mars. "'How have you bewitched them?' asked Tars Tarkas one afternoon when he had seen me run my arm far between the great jaws of one of my thoats, which had wedged a piece of stone between two of his teeth, while feeding upon the moss-like vegetation in our courtyard. By kindness, I replied. You see, Tars Tarkas, the softer sentiments have their value, even to a warrior. In the height of battle, as well as upon the march, I know that my thoats will obey my every command, and therefore my fighting efficiency is enhanced, and I am a better warrior for the reason that I am a kind master. 
your other warriors would find it to the advantage of themselves, as well as the community, to adopt my methods in this respect. Only a few days since you yourself told me that these great brutes, by the uncertainty of their tempers, often were the means of turning victory into defeat, since at a crucial moment they might elect to unseat and rend their riders. Show me how you accomplished these results, was Tars Tarkas's only rejoinder. And so I explained as carefully as I could the entire method of training I had adopted with my beasts. And later, he had me repeat it before Lorca's Tommel and the assembled warriors. That moment marked the beginning of a new existence for the poor Thotes. Before I left the community of Lorca's Tommel, I had the satisfaction of observing a regiment of as tractable and docile mounts as one might care to see. The effect on the precision and celerity of the military movements was so remarkable that Lorcus Tommel presented me with a massive anklet of gold from his own leg as a sign of his appreciation of my service to the Horde. On the seventh day following the battle with the aircraft, we again took up the march towards Thark, all probability of another attack being deemed remote by Lorcus Tommel. During the days just preceding our departure, I had seen but little of Dejah Thoris, as I had been kept very busy by Tars Tarkas with my lessons in the art of Martian warfare, as well as in the training of my thoats. The few times I had visited her quarters, she had been absent, walking upon the streets with Sola, or investigating the buildings in the near vicinity of the plaza. I had warned them against venturing far from the plaza, for fear of the great white apes, whose ferocity I was only too well acquainted with. However, since Wula accompanied them on all their excursions, and as Sola was well armed, there was comparatively little cause for fear. On the evening before our departure, I saw them approaching along one of the great avenues which led into the plaza from the east. I advanced to meet them, and telling Sola I would take responsibility for Dejah Thoris' safekeeping, I directed her to return to her quarters on some trivial errand. I liked and trusted Sola, but for some reason I desired to be alone with Dejah Thoris, who represented to me all that I had left behind on earth in agreeable and congenial companionship. There seemed bonds of mutual interest between us, as powerful as though we had been born under the same roof, rather than upon different planets, hurtling through space some 48 million miles apart. That she shared my sentiments in this respect, I was positive, for on my approach, the look of pitiful hopelessness left her sweet countenance to be replaced by a smile of joyful welcome as she placed her little right hand upon my left shoulder in true Red Martian salute. Sir Koja told Sola that you'd become a true Thark, she said, and that I would now see no more of you than any of the other warriors. Sir Koja's a liar of the first magnitude, I replied, notwithstanding the proud claim of the Tharks to absolute verity. Dejah Thoris laughed. I knew that even though you became a member of the community, you would not cease to be my friend. A warrior may change his metal, but not his heart, as the saying is upon Barsoom. I think they've been trying to keep us apart, she continued, for whenever you've been off duty, one of the older women of Tars Tarkas's retinue has always arranged to trump up some excuse to get Sola and me out of sight. They've had me down to the pits below the buildings, helping them mix their awful radium powder and make their terrible projectiles. You know that these have to be manufactured by artificial light, as exposure to sunlight always results in an explosion. You've noticed that their bullets explode when they strike an object? Well, the opaque outer coating is broken by the impact, exposing a glass cylinder, almost solid, in the forward end of which is a minute particle of radium powder. The moment the sunlight, even though diffused, strikes this powder, it explodes with a violence which nothing can withstand. If you ever witness a night battle, you will note the absence of these explosions, while the morning following the battle will be filled at sunrise with the sharp detonations of exploding missiles fired the preceding night. As a rule, however, non-exploding projectiles are used at night. Parenthetical author's note. I've used the word radium in describing this powder because, in the light of recent discoveries on Earth, I believe it to be a mixture of which radium is the base. In Captain Carter's manuscript, it's mentioned always by the name used in the written language of helium, and it's spelled in hieroglyphics, which would be difficult and useless to reproduce. While I was much interested in Dejah Thoris's explanation of this wonderful adjunct to Martian warfare, 
and was more concerned by the immediate problem of their treatment of her. That they were keeping her away from me was not a matter for surprise, but that they should subject her to such dangerous and arduous labor filled me with rage. Have they ever subjected you to cruelty and ignominy, Dejathoris? I asked, feeling the hot blood of my fighting ancestors leap in my veins as I awaited her reply. Only in little ways, John Carter, she answered. Nothing that can harm me outside my pride. They know that I am the daughter of ten thousand Jeddaks, and I trace my ancestry straight back, without a break, to the builder of the first great waterway. And they, who do not even know their own mothers, are jealous of me. At heart, they hate their horrid fates, and so wreak their poor spite on me, who stand for everything they have not, and for all they most crave, and can never attain. Let us pity them, my chieftain, for even though we die at their hands, we can afford them pity, since we are greater than they, and they know it. Had I known the significance of those words, my chieftain, as applied by a red Martian woman to a man, I should have had the surprise of my life, but I did not know it at that time, nor for many months thereafter. Yes, I still had much to learn upon Barsoom. I presume it to be the better part of wisdom that we bow to our fate with as good a grace as possible, Dejithoris, but I hope, nevertheless, that I may be present the next time that any Martian, green, red, pink, or violet, has the termidity even so much frown on you, my princess. Dejithoris caught her breath at my last words, and gazed upon me with dilated eyes and quickening breath, and then, with an odd little laugh, which brought roguish dimples to the corners of her mouth, shook her head and cried, What a child! A great warrior, and yet a stumbling little child. What have I done now? I asked, in sore perplexity. Some day you shall know, John Carter, if we live, but I may not tell you. And I, the daughter of Moore's Kajak, son of Tardis Moore's, have listened without anger, she soliloquized in conclusion. Then she broke out again in one of her gay, happy, laughing moods, joking with me on my prowess as a Thark warrior, as contrasted with my soft heart and natural kindness. I presume that should you accidentally wound an enemy, you would take him home and nurse him back to health, she laughed. That is precisely what we do on Earth, I answered, at least among civilized men. This made her laugh again. She could not understand it, for, with all her tenderness and womanly sweetness, she was still a Martian, and to a Martian, the only good enemy is a dead enemy, for every dead foeman means so much more to divide between those who live. I was very curious to know what I had said or done to cause her so much perturbation a moment before, and so I continued to importune her to enlighten me. No, she exclaimed, it is enough that you have said it and that I have listened. And when you learn, John Carter, and if I be dead, as likely I shall be, ere the further moon has circled Barsoom another twelve times, remember that I listened, and that I... smiled. It was all Greek to me, but the more I begged her to explain, the more positive became her denials of my request. And so, in very hopelessness, I desisted. Day had now given away to night, and as we wandered along the great avenue lighted by the two moons of Barsoom, with Earth looking down upon us out of her luminous green eye. It seemed that we were all alone in the universe, and I, at least, was content that it should be so. The chill of the Martian night was upon us, and removing my silks, I threw them across the shoulders of Dejah Thoris. As my arm rested for an instant upon her, I felt a thrill pass through every fiber of my being, such as contact with no other mortal had ever produced. And it seemed to me that she had leaned slightly toward me, but of that I was not sure. I only knew that as my arm rested there across her shoulder, longer than the act of adjusting the silk required, she did not draw away, nor did she speak. And so, in silence, we walked the surface of a dying world, but in the breast of one of us, at least, had been born that which is ever oldest, yet ever new. I loved Dejah Thoris, touch of my arm upon her naked shoulder had spoken to me in words I would not mistake. I knew that I had loved her since the first moment that my eyes had met hers that first time in the plaza at the dead city of Khorad. 
This is Classics You Slept Through. Thanks for listening, and catch us for the next episode when we discuss what we've just read. Peace.